So in 2011, I was working on a story with my good friend Jason Meiklin about a wall that India had built around the entire country of Bangladesh. Uh, at the time, what had happened was there was this 14-year-old girl who had been shot by these border guards uh, on the Indian side of the fence. She was trying to get into Bangladesh. And it, her corpse hanging on the fence was this national symbol of resilience and the oppression uh, by the Indian military. And the article I wrote about that um, was sort of about the current political situation. But it raised this question in my mind that I didn't have an answer to immediately, which was, why did India build a fence around Bangladesh? Uh, and to get to that answer, we had to go back 50 years in history to this astounding story about the deadliest storm in human history and how that almost destroyed the entire world. Uh, and this has set off all sorts of regional, uh, international, and global conflicts. And frankly, we have pretty much all forgotten about it. Now, if you don't know me, my name's Scott Carney. I'm an investigative journalist and anthropologist, and I'm talking about uh, the subject of this book, uh, The Vortex, a true story of history's deadliest storm and unspeakable war and liberation. And I wrote it with Jason Meiklin, uh, who's a professor at the University of Oslo, and it was actually really interesting to work with an academic sort of in a co-authory role. But let me get back down and tell you about this story. So, in 1970, this enormous cyclone building on the warm waters in the Bay of Bengal comes rocketing uh, up the coast and crashes into the coast of what was then East Pakistan. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know anything about the history of South Asia, uh, in 1947, India uh, was ruled by the British and it split into two different countries, into India, which is roughly the shape that you know now, and Pakistan, which is where Pakistan is now, and East Pakistan, which was still part of the West Pakistan, uh, but it was a Bengali-speaking region, while um, Pakistan mostly speaks Urdu and Punjabi. And because of the insanity of partition, where a million people died as they fled to either country, the Hindus, Christians, mostly staying in the secular state of India, uh, while Muslims mostly going, uh, not mostly, many, many Muslims uh, going to uh, the Bengali East Pakistan and uh, the Urdu, Punjabi, and other languages, um, uh, West Pakistan, which is ruled in Islamabad. Now, at that time, uh, Pakistan sort of ruled East Pakistan as uh, sort of a colonial fiefdom, right? It, it, you know, even though the, these people uh, were all Muslims, uh, they, they were sort of having their wealth extracted, they didn't have control of the military, uh, there was a lot of resistance and agitation going on in East Pakistan at the time, and lots of, dis of, of like, West Pakistanis just saying really bad and racist things about the people living in East Pakistan. It was Pakistan was ruled by a guy named Yahya Khan, who was a general who fought the Nazis in World War II and learned, as you will see, quite a bit from the Nazis uh, in his tenure. So this storm is going up the coast and it lands, uh, and, and, and you know, if you know about the geography of East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, a lot of it's only like a foot above sea level uh, at high tide. And this storm came in uh, during a full moon and, uh, and right at the peak of high tide so that the water level rose up to 20 feet above where uh, it would be normally. And this meant millions and millions of people were uh, just, uh, you know, had no homes. The only survivors really were the ones who could climb up to the top of trees. And some of the people we interviewed uh, remembered that they, they, you know, they weren't the only ones escaping up to the top of trees. Also, the only animals that could survive also did. And we talked to this one guy who stayed for eight hours in the top of a palm tree with a whole nest of cobras, uh, king cobras, you know, the things with the, the, the 
these things. Uh, and they just stayed there the whole night as, as they watched their families, all of their livestock, their entire island get swept away. Now, in the course of a few hours, 500,000 people died. Now, for comparison, the deadliest storm in American history was in Galveston, uh, early 1900s, and it killed 5,000 people. Uh, so this was orders of magnitude more deadly. And uh, what was even more crippling in many ways was that this was happening just before the first free and fair election that the nation of Pakistan would ever hold. Now, Yahya Khan, who was again this is the, the president of Pakistan, when he inherited, he wasn't elected, but when he inherited the office of president uh, from another corrupt politician, uh, he was given one mission, which was to restore democracy to Pakistan, or give democracy to Pakistan. And he had this ethic that he was going to do the absolute best election he possibly could, even though he had many personality flaws. Uh, he was a drunk, womanizer, violent, horrible man in a number of ways. He also had like really giant eyebrows. Now, Yahya Khan was going to th hold this perfect election. But the storm landed just weeks uh, before that first election would happen. And Yahya Khan, at the time, also happened to be best friends with Richard Nixon. Yeah, that Richard Nixon, the Watergate Richard Nixon, the guy who was fighting in Vietnam, Richard Nixon, the, the notoriously most corrupt president in American history, Richard Nixon. And it was said that, that, that uh, besides a banker in Florida and Yahya Khan, uh, those were his best friends in the entire world. And this is because, you know, I don't know how much you know about Richard Nixon, but one of the things that he's known for besides Watergate was his great foreign policy, right? He opened up relations, diplomatic relations with China. Uh, and China, uh, you know, at that point had been a closed economy, America hadn't done anything, and so Nixon actually sort of opened up that trade relation. Well, the only reason he was able to do it was because Yahya Khan happened to be the backdoor political route to gaining entrance to China. Uh, Yahya Khan actually snuck um, Henry Kissinger into China on a covert mission on his own private plane to sort of uh, get entree with Mao Zedong and Zhao Enlai, the, the, the premier. Now, these guys were, were, were very tight. And when this storm hit Pakistan, um, Yahya Khan, who hated the Bengalis, he uh, was on this trade mission in China and he was you know, all the reports say he was drunk and womanizing and just having a, you know, a grand old time being a horrible person in, um, in China when the storm hits and he gets this report that, uh, you know, million of your people died. Maybe you should come check it out. And he really didn't care. He didn't arrange any aid for that region. Um, the international aid that tried to come in actually um, got stymied by him because he was like, you know, let's just let them die. Maybe it's better that uh, there's fewer voters for my election. Now, this didn't work out too well for him because the Bengalis, who were sort of a disorganized um, electorally at the time with many competing parties, uh, saw the callousness of Yahya Khan's administration and the fact that all of these people who died in the cyclone then were stricken by cholera, they were starving, they had nothing, entire islands had just disappeared, and it became a major electoral issue. Uh, and the Bengalis basically said, okay, um, we're gonna, we're gonna all vote as a bloc against you. And in the election that happened just a few weeks after the storm, uh, it was essentially the same thing as the Democrats getting 90% of the vote and the Republicans only getting this small minority. It was enough of a, a, of a, of a, a electoral flip that the locus of power would, would no longer be in West Pakistan, but would actually basically be headquartered in, in uh, 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 East Bengal. This, now if you can imagine any other president in the course of history who might be upset by a, an electoral result, um, Yahya Khan said, hey, let us, uh, you know, 
reconsider this election. And he, he had this, this devastating quote where he said, look, we just need to kill three million of them and they will eat out of our hands, which is exactly what he attempted to do. He started gathering uh, troops and flying them in from West Pakistan to East Pakistan on covert international airlines disguised as civilians. He brought a military uh, and very, very notably, um, he pressured Richard Nixon for all of the guns and ammunition he could possibly need. And Nixon delivered. Then on uh, March 26, 1971, he started something called Operation Searchlight, where as he'd been stonewalling the um, uh, Sheikh Mujib, who was the, the democratically elected leader, he, he'd been sort of just like not taking his calls for a while and saying, look, I have the power, you know, maybe we'll help you out. Um, and he stalled and he stalled and stalled until Mujib got so angry that he told his people, the Bengali people, to rise up in revolution and fight uh, the, the, the usurper. And then when he gave that speech, there were riots. It was, you know, obviously a big, um, you know, it's a big event when your political leader says, you know, you should go fight. Uh, but then Yahya Khan took that excuse, uh, uh, those sort of riots that were happening as his excuse to deploy his military. Uh, and then on March 26, he instigated Operation Searchlight. And he used American tanks, American machine guns, uh, American aircraft, American bombs to eviscerate West Bengal, uh, murdering over the course of um, about eight or nine months, three million people. I mean, and the stories are absolutely horrendous. He would light fire around villages and then machine gun the people as they tried to co-flee. Uh, he, he would um, go, go to the, the poets and rip out their tongues. The artists, he would cut out their eyes. These are things he really did. The, the stories are that he would torture people to death. Uh, like he gathered all these so-called rebels together and cut off their arms and legs and then just leave them in a pile execute them, and then bring in the next person to, to, to view those severed limbs in front of them. I mean, the, the amount of horror is really only uh, matched by what happened in the Holocaust. And I think it makes a lot of sense that Yahya Khan served fighting the Nazis and learned a lot from the Nazis when he was uh, there and just sort of redeployed the same tactics. Now, over the course of the next year, uh, uh, the Bengali resistance sort of takes off. It, it's, they're called the Mukti Bahini. And we follow the stories of several of these people who, who start off as civilians. One's a soccer star who, who becomes a, you know, a mutineer in the Bengali military, some farmers. And, and, but basically, just think about this rebel movement when your country is literally murdering everyone around you simply on the basis of the language that you speak. Uh, obviously, there's armed resistance. And then millions of people are fleeing into India. Because, you know, if you can imagine what Bangladesh is, like India sort of just just surrounds it like an arm cradling a baby, right? And and so so anyone who wanted to live wanted to go to India. And then India has, has this just enormous refugee camps coming up outside of Calcutta, uh, sort of in that whole Northeast India section. And, and Indira Gandhi, who's the leader of India at the time, cannot support that much refugee movement. I mean, just think about what we're having on the southern border of the United States when migrant caravans are to sort of go to our border. And, you know, these are you know, 10,000 people, 5,000 people. What would happen if you had 5 million people crossing the border? How would you, how would you do anything about it? So India starts rattling her sabers and, uh, and starts arming the Mukti Bahini, starts taking in all of these weapons and giving it to them. And because remember, this is in the height of the Cold War, India is a Soviet ally at that time. Pakistan is a U.S. ally. So the arms that are coming in to the Indian rebels are Soviet arms. We have a proxy war at the same time that Vietnam is raging just a few countries away. And, uh, and as this sort of buildup happens, uh, Yahya Khan uh, sort of turns to India and he knows 
shit's gonna go down. Like he knows this is going to happen. And he gets this idea that maybe he can use his overwhelming American air power to destroy the Indian targets. And so he launches this preemptive strike that is modeled on the Israeli Six Day War, uh, where he just thinks he can take out all of the Indian military. But the thing is, is the Indian military is just so much better than the Pakistan military, so much more massive. And his bombs mostly fall flat, but then Indira Gandhi has the, um, the excuse all she has to say is, look, you, you've attacked us. You know, we were, you know, totally had troops on your border, but you struck first. And then she launches over the border and, uh, and the Mukti Bahini are taking out uh, one town after another. And then, you know, Yahya Khan is getting really scared. All of his murderous generals are, are realize that they can't actually stand up um, to the Indian army in the same way they can massacre civilians. There are different tactical things going on here. And, uh, and Yahya Khan begs Richard Nixon to come in and start a second front. And lo and behold, he owes Yahya Khan a favor. And he sends in the USS Enterprise, which at the point was the most, uh, the, the largest uh, aircraft carrier uh, in our fleet. It, it's the sort of thing that could, could drop a hundred nuclear weapons on a target in the course of like a half an hour. This is the sort of thing that you put on the coast of a country to make them cower in fear. And he sends it over from Vietnam uh, to uh, threaten India, and he gives it this order that he tell, the captain Tissot is the guy who's running, who's the captain on board of, of the Enterprise. He says, you have permission to eradicate the Indian Air Force and uh, communications infrastructure uh, if, if you meet any resistance. Now, at this point, the Soviet, had been, Soviet Union had been sort of you know, keeping back, but when it, it looked like there was really going to be a war here in the Bay of Bengal, they sent a submarine fleet from Vladivostok uh, down to uh, the Bay of Bengal. And there's this sort of arbitrary red line in the sea that the, the Americans have that says, if you pass this point, um, sorry, sorry, the Soviets, the Soviets had put this arbitrary line saying, if the, if the, if the American fleet crosses that point, um, they have permission to then strike and destroy the, uh, the, not only the Enterprise, but start World War III. And any sub-commander at that time had the authority to do that, right? When, when certain conditions were met. And, uh, and the, the Rear Admiral Vladimir Kruglyakov, that's the, the, the Soviet commander, um, isn't sure he wants to end the world. Uh, and, but he's also not sure that the Americans know that there is a red line in the sea. And he, what he does is he actually lines up his submarines and missile cruisers in front of, of, the, uh, of, of the Enterprise and he surfaces the boats. Um, you know, so, so you know, the Enterprise is just chugging along and Kruglikov is down here under the surface and he realizes that he has to tell the Americans where that red line is or else uh, you know, nuclear Armageddon happens. Um, and he surfaces the boats and, 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 and Tissot now has the, he has orders to pa cross that red line and he has the permission to fire and they wire back to Nixon to say, what should we do? And Nixon is hemming and hawing. He's not sure exactly what to do. He, he, he calls up China and says, maybe you guys need to start a third front and save my, my friend Yahya Khan and, and sort of help this genocide uh, happen. And the only reason we don't get nuclear Armageddon right here is because the Mukti Bahini, those rebels, managed to take Dhaka, the, the capital of East Pakistan, and they liberate it into the country of Bangladesh. And that is the once that happens, there's no more war to fight. And the message comes back saying, okay, stand down. Don't blow up the Indian uh, army. Don't blow up all the military bases. We're going to stand down. And we came in within like a half an hour of global Armageddon. Now, the point of this story, the reason why I'm bothering to tell you this, is because this entire story is about climate change is that these enormous weather events don't just land on coastlines. They land in the middle of, of, of 
political geographies and contentious historical issues. And every time that a storm happens, it's a roll of the dice to say what will happen. And any given storm is maybe a little unlikely, but as you have more and more and more uh, extreme catastrophic events and politicians who are callous enough to ignore electoral results, politicians who, who, who uh, would give aid to some of their constituents and not other constituents. If you have situations like that, then climate change isn't just about you know, losing some beach communities or, or, or building flood barriers around cities. It's about protecting from political destabilization. And as we know, as the earth heats up, we will have more storms. As we have more storms, we will be rolling those dice more and more frequently. And so that is roughly the plot, the, the, the overarching plot of the vortex, uh, which, you know, it'll be out, <laughs> it'll be out pretty soon uh, in, at the end of March. And, uh, and we tell this story not like I just told it to you. I sort of told you the this, this straight history. We tell it through the perspectives of those actual stakeholders, those farmers who end up taking up guns and end up um, committing their own atrocities. Um, uh, the, the soccer star who, who joins the army and then has to rebel. Uh, the, the American aid workers who are trying to get food to people on the ground. Uh, it is a heart-pumping uh, story that we that we're, we're trying to tell this story of climate change as a non-fiction action thriller so thank you for like listening to my 20 minute long rant about um all things vortex but i am really really excited for this i am so excited for to uh, and so honored to have worked with jason Michelin. and and uh, and the one thing that I had forgotten to mention is that is that when we fast forward to when I was there looking, trying to figure out why India built this wall ar around Bangladesh, is that they are, India is very worried that this is going to happen again. And so they're building a wall to contain uh, the Bangladeshis who may flee to India in after this next weather event, because they are basically certain uh, that there is going to be another conflict at some point in the future. So here we are. Again, thank you so much for listening. Please leave a comment. Please rate. Please, you know, do anything you can to support this project. It's really hard to get books out into the world. And I am so excited to, um, you know, get it into your hands at some point.